Hello everyone, Dan Swift here, founder and CEO at Numentum. And welcome to the speaker series where we spotlight some of the most interesting minds in the world of revenue generation. At Numentum, we help forward-thinking B2B organizations create better buyer experiences and deliver new momentum to their revenue engine. On this episode of the speaker series, we speak with Rich O'Connor, CEO at B2B Marketing. We have a great conversation about what people get wrong about B2B marketing, being an early riser, and the discipline of thinking instead of doing. I am delighted to welcome Mr. Rich O'Connor from B2B Marketing to the Momentum Speaker Series today. Rich, thank you for joining us. Oh, great, great pleasure. Lovely to see you, Dan. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So, so let's start with you telling us just a little bit about B2B Marketing and your role over there. Sure. Well, I'm um, I'm CEO of, of B2B Marketing and we are a community intelligence business. So um, what we mean by that is we bring together the global B2B marketing community at a number of our events. Um, so we run conferences uh, in, the, in the UK and the US. We run uh, awards, UK, US. Um, and we have a, a, a global platform called Propolis, um, a community intelligence uh, membership community um, where we bring together uh, global marketing leaders uh, to share expertise, uh, access solutions, and, and access uh, B2B marketing intelligence. Wow. Well, so B2B marketing in itself as a name, that's a big name. So tell us a little bit more about how it got its start. And obviously it's been around for a little while. So how has it evolved over the years to, to what it is today? Yeah, well, you, you can imagine that the, the, the having B2B marketing as your business name as the same name as, as the industry itself can get confusing from a brand point of view sometimes. But uh, there is a reason for it. And that is that um, if you go back to 2003, uh, there really wasn't, uh, certainly in Europe, a, a, a B2B marketing home, a place for B2B marketing. There were a number of B2B marketing, uh, B, sorry, B2C uh, marketing magazines, marketing, marketing week, campaign, there's ad week in, in the uh, US as well. Um, and there was nothing for, for B2B marketing. It was seen as this kind of slightly quirky adjunct to consumer marketing. Our founders, Joel Harrison and James Farmer, had sort of seen this, this opportunity uh, for what was actually a growing and, and in some cases thriving B2B marketing uh, world uh, to, to create a, a magazine, a home for, for B2B marketing. And they created literally B2B marketing magazine, which was you know a tiny circulation magazine, literally hand delivered to agencies and, and clients. But it became the natural home for, for B2B marketing. And to their absolute credit, um, you know, the business has... Has, has really been credited with being the the kind of spiritual home for, for B2B marketing over the last uh, 20 years. And we're in our 20th year this year. So coming forward to 2021, um, it grow, the magazine doesn't exist anymore, but it's grown into conferences and awards. Um, but we also in, in 2021 built Propolis, which is our um, membership uh, community that, that, that I described earlier, um, which has really um, become the, the home for, for global B2B marketing leaders. So yeah, exciting um, and, and yeah. a lovely, lovely place to work. I love it. And, and we're obviously um, Propolis members. We were uh, Ignite in, in Chicago and again in London. So again, can validate everything you've said. It's it, it's phenomenal experiences, both online and, and also uh, in person. I've got, I've got a big question for you, Rich. So you see a lot and you experience a lot doing what you do. What's something you think people get wrong about b2b marketing and i'm talking about the discipline at large rather than the uh, the company sure yeah i mean i, I think two things and, and they're related one one is that b2c is in some way superior to b2b um because i think it's easy to think of all of the you know the consumer brands out there and the marketing they do and the branding they do and everything we see every day in out of home advertising and tv and uh, in, in in print um, to think that that is the, the kind of senior partner in marketing, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, if you think of a, a, a the purchase, a consumer purchase of a car, that is one ultimate purchase. But there are 300 B2B transactions that go into to the creation of a car. And it is this kind of hidden engine room of mm. global growth that's been around for decades. And mm -hmm. I think the other misconception about B2B is that 
somebody described it recently as you know b2b marketers have been coloring in powerpoint presentations in the basement which is slightly insulting and just patently not true there's this thing that b2b marketing is only st suddenly starting to emerge and you know it's great greatest years are ahead of it i agree actually the greatest years are ahead of it but it's been around for decades and it's been this pumping engine room of, of growth and it's a bit insulting to b2b marketers frankly to say anything different because you know we judge uh, we, we run the b2b marketing awards and we see the quality of creativity of innovation of of expertise uh year in year out um so i think this sense that b2b is in some way inferior is just just wrong and anyone in b2b marketing will will attest yeah. to that people listening to this now will be high-fiving each other's behind the scenes <laughs> I'm now looking desperately on LinkedIn on my other screen here to see what you studied um, at university. Uh, talk to us about that. And, and, and has that bled into what you're doing now in any way, shape or form? Oh, my, listen, my parents wish it had. Um, but I, 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 I didn't particularly enjoy secondary school. So I, I did my A-levels, but I didn't particularly enjoy it. I found it quite claustrophobic. And um, But when I went to university, I, I didn't like being told what to do. I think that was the problem. And I went to university and it's kind of on your own terms. And I absolutely squeezed every last drop of experience out of university. I just kind of, you know, found my found myself, I suppose. You know, it's a bit a bit trite, but um, yeah. I just just I just loved it. I, I loved what I did. I, I did my degree, um, science and technology policy. I went on did a, a master's in uh, local economic development, and I stayed on did a, I was the um, president of the students' union for a year. Did a sabbatical, ran a campaign, and um, wow. got, paid the princely sum of nine thousand pounds uh, for the year. <laughs> Um, and it was and, and although um i i ended up leaving university hoping to go into urban regeneration um but i like many people went into a media sales job to pay off a few debts and never left um right. you know, ended up in a sales role and then you know loved it really enjoyed uh, you know the process of selling landed in a really great business called the builder group got good training um really good training and coaching um started to earn commission and then looking back to going into urban regeneration i've had to take a ten thousand pound pay cut so um i just yeah I, I ended up in sales and, and carried on through that media path and i tell you what the training was that good i ended up marrying the trainer as well so we've been married <laughs> for 20 years now <laughs> amazing oh priceless there's a conversation there for another time um exactly <laughs> now um, i want to take you um back to some of the experiences that you've had but before we go there a lot of people listening to today's call will be fascinated to see what a typical day looks like for you. So if you don't mind, can you give us some details as well? We want to kind of know what time does it start? If, if there's any any routines that you have, any structures to your day or your weeks that kind of work for you? When does it all wrap? When does it end? Can you can you give us a bit of a flavor of what a day in the life of Rich O'Connor looks like? Wow. Uh, chaotic uh, quite a lot of the time. That's at home. Uh, uh -huh. Three teenage kids who are, who are sporty. But but I, I tend to go into the office, into London, three days a week. Um, I, I like to get up early. Um, so I get up at 5.35. Um, yeah, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, I'm out the door at five past six. I'm on the train at 6.19. I'm at my desk by 7.20. And, and I'm glad you picked up the specificity of it because um, uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, which I, you know, we'll perhaps talk about in a, in a while, on transformation and Part of that was process improvement and learned how to do kind of value stream mapping and um, uh, root cause analysis, five whys, Kaizen and those sort of um, uh, process improvement techniques. And I, I'm also really competitive. So I am so, so much so that I compete with myself. So getting out of the house in the morning is all about process improvement. So I'm constantly challenging myself to shave off seconds here and there. So um, getting out clothes the night before, um, putting on the kettle and getting dressed before the kettle's boiled, um, letting the tea brew while I get my shoes on. Um, and the reason it's so precise is I used to get up at 5.30, but I've managed to say five minutes in the last nine months. So I now get up at 5.35. Um, and it's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, it is ridiculous, but that is how I start my day. Just going, damn, I've missed that button. So I've, you know, I've, I've lost three seconds there. Um, but it, but it uh, keeps me entertained uh, early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But listen, whatever works for you as a human being, right? We've all got our, our things. What about, so you're obviously an early riser based on what you just said. What about evenings? Um, 
and you've got you know kids in their teenage uh, teenagers what what does that look like yeah i mean I, I do two days from home as well and you know try and squeeze in exercise and and running and you know that's all good for for, for keeping you sane but but yeah i've got three teenage children you know one's at university in his first year he's back now um and it and it is literally um dr- dropping and attending and picking up from sport you know one my daughter plays netball she was in London last night. We live in Sussex. Uh, she plays, you know, because why Why wouldn't you? On a Monday evening, she plays netball in Stratford in East London um, uh, with, a, with a London club because, you know, why would you play for a local club and when you can play for a club in London? Uh, well, she yeah. plays for a local club as well. But And then there's there's rugby training and pre-season and, um, you know, the boys are 17 or 15. They go to the gym and they try and drag me there. And, yeah, it it, it, it is it is chaos. So, there isn't much time in the evening. We try to sit down and, um, you know, have a meal together with whoever's around, you know, yeah. chew the fat over the day um, and then collapse into bed and try and read a couple of pages of a book, really. And that, that's about it, really, <laughs> during the week. And then back up in the morning at what, uh, and out there, 5.35. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Outside of work, clearly you're getting pulled in different directions, but in work, in your role... There's so many things you could be doing. How do you stay focused on what's important and what needs to get done? It's 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 a constant challenge, and I'm, I know I'm not alone in in this because I've never never been afraid to to roll up my sleeves and and get stuck in. And particularly when you come from a sales background, part of you wants to be on every sales call and help with every sales call and be there to coach or you know just just be part of it and you know, it, it, that can be helpful, but it's also, you also have to kind of catch yourself and, and trust trust the people, uh, uh, you know, the, the people in the team to do it. And I get told, just trust us, Rich, you know, you don't need to be on these sales calls. Um, but but I think rolling up your sleeves and being able to dive in is is, is important. But actually often it, it, that can get out of control. And I think actually what the business needs um, is slightly different. They need a clear vision and a strategy and, and actually, I think the role they need me to play is to, I guess, kind of lay lay the path and then get obstacles out of the way to, to let them succeed. And the discipline is really difficult because, especially when you're not in a, in a large corporate as well, and, you know, there are lots of questions and lots of people who, you know, want want help is is actually not not getting sucked into always mm. into the operational side of the business and and just staying above because you can't think you know you can be as bright as you like but if you're constantly doing the doing you can't do the thinking what's thinking the kind of three four quarters ahead is impossible if you're you know doing bits of everybody else's job so but that's not you know that's a, that's a discipline that i have to wrestle with um and i don't i don't always get right um but you have to kind of catch yourself sometimes yeah no i i Trust me, that resonates. <laughs> okay, so you've, you've answered it kind of, but I want to ask you very specifically, as the CEO, what is something that people may not know about the pressures of your role? I think I think one of the big things is often people in the organisation look to you to know a lot of the answers to challenges or direction, and they think because of your position that you you have the answers um where where they don't almost always i don't know the answer um and that i guess the difference is you learn to own the process of getting to the answer i don't know what the market's going to do in 6 to 9 months i don't know whether this supplier is going to be better than the other supplier i don't know um whether we're going to hit our numbers next year or whether our marketing cap, but, but actually, and I don't know, you know, how, how do we, how are we going to improve our operating model, but actually owning the process and, and then teaching people to own the process of getting there, involving the right expertise, bringing in other uh, minds into the, into the, the process, stepping through small steps rather than, you know, thinking with the, with the end in mind. I think, I think people think, you know, the answer, but actually you don't, you, you own the process and, and work through the business to get to the answer. I think a second thing is just the, the pressure, the sheer, I think people often feel that um, because I try to be even tempered and not volatile is that, you know, there's no worries and anxiety. They're all there. They're mm. all there. All of the yeah. um, fretting and worry and waking up 
you know, with work popping into your head, it's all here. Mm-hmm. But I guess you just you just learn the coping mechanisms um, to try and try and keep it keep it under wraps. Um, you're making me think about that swan gliding beautifully across the yeah, lake. Yeah, it's a great metaphor. Right? And underneath, it's like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> it's true. It's a, it's a great. It's a great. Um, it's a great image, and and, and often that's true. Um, yeah. But but learning how to 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 cope with that, and you know, I, I remember, I remember, I've, I've had a coach um, for the same coach for fifteen years. Um, absolutely uh, a brilliant coach. She knows me so well. I remember her once saying to me, she said, look. I should say I get really anxious on a Monday morning. I, you know, I get into work. I'm a bit tired from the weekend, and that's my my moment where I just, you know, things start to get, to get, you know, feel overwhelming. She said, "What you need to just do is recognize that that fit. Just recognize your energy. Recognize how your week works. Because do you feel like that on a Tuesday?" I said, "Well, no, I don't actually. It's specifically Monday morning." And she said, "Well, just say to yourself that won't be there." even Monday afternoon, it won't be there on Tuesday. And it actually was one of the best pieces of advice because it's true. You recognize in yourself that your mood and how you feel about things is so dependent on what you've eaten, how tired you are, whether you've had a good night's sleep, whether you've had a, you know, a fractious weekend with the kids or your wife or, but it, yeah. it will pass. Um, yeah. And I think actually that one of, that's one of the, yeah, one of the best pieces of advice ever because it does pass. Um, yeah. It comes in cycles. I love what you also said, um, as part one of the answer around not having all the answers and people do expect us as CEOs to have all the answers. And the way you answered it shows vulnerability. Very few leaders publicly say, I don't know. And, and I love, I love that. And I do the same. I don't know. I don't know all the answers. How could we possibly, we've got our playbooks, we've got our experience. We know what's worked previously, but we don't have crystal balls. So we, we can expect, but I, I love how you answered that. Well, it, it, it's true, and and that that comes from having experiences of other people who've who've done that. You know, yeah. to you, but you know, you're you're you you're shaped by the people you work with, and and you know have reported to over the years. And I've been lucky enough to, you know, have have bad influences and people who I just don't want to model, but, but I've had some really good ones too. B two B SaaS data exhibitions, conferences, virtual events, uh, digital and print media. And I know you've also done this across obviously EMEA, but Asia and the US. So what challenges or best practices did you find hardly changed across industries and geos and people? You know, I, I, I didn't know this and I wish I'd known it earlier in my career, um, but I learned it um, at what, my, my time at UBM. The, the, the two things that are consistent anywhere, businesses of that are at scale, gl- large global corporations and tiny businesses, strategy and operating model. That's what drives that's what drives a business. It doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter you know which territory, which country, what size. You've got to know where you're going and what the goal is. Mm-hmm. So you can galvanize the business behind you and galvanize people behind a vision because that's what motivates them. You take money off the table. Actually, what motivates people is getting behind something they believe in. So they've got something to get out of bed for in the morning, but then operating model. And what I mean by that is, and I learned this from spending a lot of time with Deloitte um, and, 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 and actually putting an operating model into, into um, a business, um, UBM, it's people, process, tech and data. So people, it's the right organizational design, clear roles, job descriptions. So people know what they, what they're supposed to do and what they're measured on. And then, mm-hmm process, ways of working. How do we work at our best? And how do we continually improve the way that we work? Um, technology, the right the right technology, not, not necessarily Salesforce and, and a Ferrari or Eloqua in a small business, the right technology for the right size of the business and then adopted really well. And then really good reporting um, mm-hmm. so that you know that it's working. And that, that whole operating model, um, almost system that's what makes really good businesses work and we, we you know we don't always get it right and it's it's always a, a you know constantly tweaking and things don't work but that is what all that is what to me is consistent across all good businesses love that now um you have worked in um covering different jurisdictions and in different industries 
and worked in some incredible organizations. So what would you say of all the things that you've done is the proudest moment in your career? Well, I, I was I was given, I fell into, I was, I was in sales, um, you know, selling three line classified ads and recruitment ads and then display ads. And then I went into newspapers and sold travel ads and then creative solutions and all that. And I, I, eight years at the independent, I went back to UBM. I started my career there, married the trainer. Um, I went back into to UBM and I was running a business unit there. And I, I'd always been interested in training and obviously uh, coaching and sales process and how to improve sales. And I'd done a little bit of that as a sideshow really to my core role. And I, it started to have an impact on a, on a global exhibitions business that had grown through um, in or inorganically, lots of acquisitions, not particularly well integrated, but actually the underlying organic growth was quite poor. Um, and I did some work to sort of, you know, show the fact that the organic growth was quite poor um, and then set apart to how, how we could change that. And then we had a new CEO came in from an engineering background, a guy called Tim Cobber, really inspirational for me, um, came from an engineering background, came in with a kind of a brief to, you know, really professionalise industrialize he called it which didn't go down particularly well but professionalized the organization um and he looked at what i've been doing in sales excellence and said look that is really good that's what we need to do but instead of just doing it in you know the uk can you do it for you know a mere age can you do it for the whole business basically the exam question is how does sales work at ubm and can you create the operating model um to uh, deliver on that. I didn't even know what an operating model was, uh, by the way. And I was just I was just given this extraordinary opportunity to create a sales operating model. And then latterly I helped with the marketing operating model for a global organization. It was it was incredible. Um and 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 the, the proudest moment I suppose was um when I was asked to go and do this in, in Asia. So I'd never spent much time other than you know occasion what you know one holiday in Asia but I to go in and do this work in Hong Kong, then in mainland China, in Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hangzhou, um, then in Southeast Asia. And and that Asia, and particularly China, was just a black box. It was, I didn't know it. Um, I didn't know how to affect change. There were language difficulties. Everyone just said, you can't do it. You know, Western person coming in, trying to drive a change project, didn't, you know, forget it. But we did. And I had the support of Deloitte um who were who were absolutely superb so working with you know the best of the best who helped um helped us um and we drove this extraordinary change you know examples we took there were 117 different job titles for salespeople in europe 110 different job titles for salespeople in asia and we took them down to a job family of 13 job titles that's that's the sort of thing that happens in loads of organizations right you know you don't want to lose someone you don't want to pay them anymore so you give them you know chief you know vice president of southeast bosnia um because you you inflate their title rather than give them you know to, to keep them and that had gone on for years and years and years so to take a an od from this absolutely out of control od into these yeah. you know a, a much more structured um organizational design was that in itself was a challenge we rolled out salesforce um we put in um proper sales processes new commission schemes training and coaching programs um and we kind of did it in 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 a in a a region in asia in particular we did it in all three regions but in asia in particular it was we were told it was impossible and we we kind of did it how long how long was that whole process from start to finish i mean so four that- years four years wow. four years <laughs> literally out, out i was out a week uh, a week a month uh, for three years into Hong Kong and um, mainland China and Southeast Asia, uh, I didn't ever live out there, but I was out. I was backwards and forwards, and we put a team out there to to drive it in in um, in territory. Um, but it was brilliant. I'm, you know, I still got great friends out there, and yeah, incredible experience. And it made the world so much smaller. Yeah, it felt China, China and and it just felt so far away, and it's made the world so much smaller for me. Um, which I think is good for the children to see, for my children to see that actually it's not this sort of out there. It's it's much closer than you think. Um, and, and they've got the same values and challenges and beliefs and attitudes that, that everybody in the West has. Um, yeah.
you've been described by your peers as smart, engaging, energetic. I get that from this conversation. Creative, charming, rich. The list goes on. But this yeah. quote stood out to me the most, right? Surprisingly for such a lovely bloke, he has a killer instinct and does not easily give up the fight for business. There you go. How do you feel about that? Oh God, I think that was some performance review when I was at, at, at the Independent. I, I, um, I, uh, well, I'm slightly sort of embarrassed, but I, um, I've, I've worked for the Independent. When I worked for the Independent newspaper, UK newspaper, we were fourth out of four. We were up. We do pitches for you know to to win the Mercedes launch of the C class business. It would be a million pound brief. And we'd go into ad agencies and we'd be pitching against the Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian, Channel 4. Uh, increasingly, as Google came on stream, it was Google. And we'd have to scrap because they had a bigger reach. They were better established. So we had to work harder. So we'd do all-nighters and come up with a better creative concept. Um, and we'd work really hard on the big idea rather than rely on our reach. So, And we'd win. And we didn't win everything, but we won more than we should. Um, because we really scrapped for the business and worked hard. And we had such great creative people um, that, you know, that that points around, you don't know the answer, but you bring minds together and you come up with a better solution. That was absolutely at play there. And then I guess, I guess, um, you know, either working on a complex project or working on something that feels hard became kind of part of the part of the DNA of my, my work, really, um, you know, a, a, a transformation project that just, couldn't be done well, okay well let's let's have a go anyway um and then even now you know working at, at b2b marketing you know you feel like you're the underdog to b2c sometimes but you're not and you know you it, you you pick up the the baton and and take the take the fight to take the fight to the industry so um yeah i guess being being i like being part of the underdog and you know scrapping scrapping for business um so perhaps perhaps that's where it came from I'm, I'm thinking of the term professionally tenacious now as I, uh, as I think about you. I think that describes it quite nicely. But um, well, well, a couple of things for you. So so based on the life that you've just described, um, outside of work and then obviously um, what you're doing right now with B2B marketing, is there anything you, you'd do differently when you look back at your life? Um, I, I don't. I've I've been lucky enough to to work with quite a few. Um, I've been through lots of leadership programs, as I'm sure you have. You know, you, you're lucky when you work with a corporate for a long time. And one of them really made me rethink a bit of a life perspective. Really, we are we are we're a company called Achieve Breakthrough, amazing company. Um, and they just described how we're all anchored by the past. So we all have it's it's all of our lives are anchored and, and in some ways held back by the past um mm. but they made the point that there's nothing you can do about it. it's helpful context but there's absolutely nothing you can do to change it the only thing that you can affect is the future um mm. it's the difference between leading and lagging indicators in sales um but you, you can't affect the past so yeah i'm sure there's things i do differently and if i go down that path on a on a, on a down day i'd probably you know, find lots of things I want to do differently, but I try to stand in the future yeah. um, because actually I'd rather do to tomorrow differently. This is going to sound terribly twee, but tomorrow differently than worry about what I've, what I've done in the past. Um, is that what you'd tell your 12 year old self then? Would it be um, like control the controllables? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I guess it, I guess it is control the control, the controllables. Um, I think that's a really important thing in sport as well, because you know, if I think about our, my children, you know, they often turn up to games. They have another look at, the, you know, that girl's, you know, that goal shoots really tall. Gosh, she's really fast. Or, you know, that second row is bigger than me. But they've lost the game before they even started um, because they're, they're not, you know, you can't control how big or fast or, or agile they are. All you can control is your game uh, and mm -hmm. your experience. So I, I do think it is controlling the controllables and, trying not to worry about the things that you can't influence. So someone is listening to this today and they're starting out their career journey. What's your biggest piece of advice if they want to have your position one day? 
Um, I think have a have always approach things with an even better if attitude. So whatever you whatever you do, even if you do something well, what does even better if look like? If if I could just improve that, because if you're doing that, you're constantly learning and improving. Um, and it's it, you know it's hard to do consistently, but just having that mindset is is really important. I think also being be hard on problems, not on people, is another one. Um, it's good. Because I think it's really this the emergence of kind of kind leadership. It doesn't mean doesn't mean you don't hold people to account. It doesn't mean you manage you don't manage underperformance. It doesn't mean you don't um, expect the best. But actually, if you if you're hard on the problem first, and sometimes you do have to be hard on the people, but just be hard on the problem first, um, and and not try and blame others. You you tend to get a better result. And I think that probably the other thing is, you know, from somebody going from a management position or a functional expert into a into a leadership position is is invest in relationships because the biggest derailer from a senior manager or a manager into a very senior leadership position is relationships. That's where things derail. They can be absolutely brilliant at their job, but if they don't have the relationships and um, aren't able to, uh, they don't have to be friends with everybody, but cultivate that relationship of, of professional respect. That's where that, that derailer tends to come in. And, and tell us just a level deeper, why does that matter? So you were a first time leader or been in leadership. And if you don't have those relationships, what does that, what does that end up, what ends, what, what ends up happening? Because I think you, you may well be um, in, in, in all organizations, there are, there are choices. There are always people competing for uh, more senior positions. And you might, if you're technically as good as somebody else, um, and somebody else is able to fulfill the job as as well as you. Um, it's going to be the um, the level of trust that you've built through uh, the relationship that that might make the difference. Because ultimately, the hire, uh, it doesn't matter how objective and unbiased they are, they're a human being. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same principle of as, as selling. Um, if all things are equal, then people are going to buy from somebody they like. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's the same in organizations. People, when you get to a certain level, they want to work with people that can do the job, but they're actually trust and they're going to enjoy working with. Yeah, I love that. OK, last question for you, Rich. If you could just wave your hand and change one thing about the business world, what would it be? Um, I, well, I think the business world and actually the world. Uh, I, I, I think. Um, I don't think capitalism is working. Um, I personally don't think socialism is the answer either, um, because I, I just don't think with you know the, the, it sounds a big subject, but I just don't think I think it's nuts that there's so much wealth in the world and we can't distribute it properly. But I think the reason both of those things things don't work is because they're prone to human frailty and and greed really. And I I wish I could change. And come up with or somebody could come up with a political and economic model that could genuinely distribute wealth fairly and it did make me think whether actually that could be a really good application for ai you know yeah. what would actually be a fair way of running the global economy um because the second you put humans in it's it's prone to their influence and bias anyway big big thoughts but that's what i would change well, I think that's a beautiful way to end this conversation. Rich, I want to say a massive thank you on behalf of Numentum for, for joining us today. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, it's been a, it's been a, a pleasure as always, Dan. Thank you for thank you for having me.